The Premade Year, session number 324. Hello, and welcome to The Premade Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Welcome to The Pre-Med Years. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every week, where I have amazing guests and great information to help you on your journey to medical school. This week is no different. I have two great guests, both from the Summer Health Professions Education Program, or SHPEP, which is a program, a free summer program for freshman and sophomore college students to give you a look into the health professions that you are interested in. We're going to talk all about what the SHPEP is, what its mission is, why it was started, and so much more. If you are interested in applying to the SHPEP program, then you need to do that by February 15th, 2019. As we're releasing this, the application deadline is February 15th. If you're listening to this in the future, go to shpep.org and check out the new dates for whatever year you are listening to this in the future. And welcome. Let's go ahead and jump in and say hello to Shantez Bailey and Dr. Norma Iris Polhunter. Norma, Shantez, welcome to the pre med years. Thank you for joining me. Thank you Thank for you having the invitation. Yeah. I'm excited. This is the first time I think that I've had somebody from the the gods of the medical school world, the pre med world, the double AMC on the podcast. So I'm excited to get you on and talk about this amazing program, the Summer Health Professions Education Program for pre-med students. So I want to start with you, Shantez, and just get a little bit of a background with what you do at the SHPEP, we'll call it from here on out. Yeah, absolutely. So I serve as a team lead for the communications and outreach aspect of the initiative. And primarily what I'm in charge of is just making sure that I increase the visibility and overall awareness of the SHPP initiative. So I like to say I sort of serve as the voice of the program, and I just like to go out and help recruit potential applicants that would be interested in attending the program. So you're like, you're like the evangelist for the program. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All That's right. a great term. <laughs> and Norma, what about you? What do you do there at the program? Yes, uh, I serve as the deputy director for the Summer Health Professions Education Program, and it's funded actually by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, AMC, and the American Dental Education Association serve as the national program office. So we help to provide technical direction and assistance. And so as the deputy director, I'm responsible for the oversight of the national program. Okay. Which is implemented at 12 institutions across the United States. Yeah. So we'll dive into the locations and how that all happens. But let's talk about the the initiative to begin with. This year, if I'm not mistaken, we're recording this in 2019. This is your 30th anniversary. So what was the the goal of this initiative when it started 30 years ago? Sure, I can start off. The vision, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation conducted a study where they learned in the early 80s, I believe it was, to understand why there was a lack of diversity within the physician workforce. And what they found was that although there were quote-unquote qualified applicants from Latino, African-American, American, and Latin Native communities, that what was happening is that many of the students didn't know exactly what to do They weren't socialized to the process of applying to medical school, the interview process, just the whole from the point of selecting an institution to going to interviews, writing essays, that there was a lot of, there were a lot of unknowns, particularly for students who came from underrepresented communities. And so based on their preliminary research, they decided to develop this program in 1989 that started as the Minority Medical Education Program to provide students from underserved communities, particularly at that time, it was African-American, Mexican-American, American American Indian, Alaska Native, and mainland Puerto Ricans to be able to support their interest in pursuing 
medicine as a career. Okay. And so starting out 30 years ago, trying to serve the underserved as far as pre-med world, how have you seen that mission be accomplished over these 30 years? Are, are you tracking that with matriculants in a medical school and seeing an increase in diversity there? Yes, we actually have very robust data that demonstrate that the program has been quite significant in increasing the diversity of the applicant pool, as well as those who actually matriculate and graduate from medical school. And so today, based on our data, we have numbers that show that about 67% to 68, it depends on the year, of those who participate in the program actually apply to medical school. And of that group of applicants, about 66 to 68% tend to get in into medical school. And to date, we have about a little over 7,000 individuals who participated in the program who are physicians and dentists because we expanded to dentistry in 2006. Okay. So we have some really good results. Is the program limited to underrepresented minorities? No, actually, the program has evolved over the 30 years to really broadly define diversity and who is underrepresented in medicine. If AMC does a lot of great work in terms of research and data, and for example, recently released a what we call analysis in brief that showed that the overwhelming majority of medical students' family income is at the top fifth quintiles of U.S. income. So basically, it's a lot of rich people going to medical school. <laughs> and so, you know, to simplify it, right? Yeah, but that wasn't me. That is- wasn't me. I, I, I want to clarify. That wasn't me going to medical school, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'll be the bottom part. Yeah, so, but we rec- so basically, we recognize that talent, we need talent from all across different segments of our society. And so when we think about serving the underserved, that's very broadly defined as individuals who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, not only those who are historically underrepresented in medicine, but also students who come from rural communities, urban communities, individuals who have various identities that are not well represented in medicine. And so the program has evolved to think about underrepresentation much more broadly beyond just race and ethnicity. Okay, but still focusing on underrepresented in some manner. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this this journey. The the pre med journey is long. It's crazy, and that's what we talk about here on on the pre med years is is kind of demystifying the whole process for somebody looking at the SHPEP. Should they be looking at it as a high school student, as a freshman, sophomore? What age range? What part of their journey are you looking for students to be involved in? Well, I think when it comes to our students, because I really am part of the recruitment effort, we really would like to consider, or high school students, upperclassmen, junior and seniors, to really consider within the, their first or second year of college, just getting ready for the SHPP application process. That way they can hit the ground running as soon as they become a freshman. But the program is catered to uh, freshmen and sophomore students, college freshmen and sophomore students, and or students who have 60 college credits or less. And so that is particularly important for students who might be attending community college. So community college students, Mm -hmm. they can attend as well as they have, as long as they have 60 college credits or less. Interesting. Okay. So you're looking for somebody pretty early on. And what's the thought process behind that early on versus later in the journey? Sure. Actually, the program, as it's evolved throughout the years, has um, evaluated what works and what doesn't work. And what we found is for students, especially when they come from underserved communities, that sometimes getting to the junior and senior year, that there are a lot of missed opportunities to build a strong profile to be competitive to medical school, dental school, other graduate programs. And so they found that in some research that was done through the Robert Johnson Foundation, that getting students earlier was the most beneficial, but like anything of early intervention, more like prevention versus, you know, basically putting a Band-Aid on something, but really building up in the student's capacity to be successful early on. And so it is unique in that it is for freshman and sophomore college students. 
And that started when the program in 2006, when it expanded to include dentistry, that was a major shift in no longer accepted students who were in their junior, senior, or post-baccalaureate years. So the focus is to build their strengths and to focus on academic enrichment. Okay. So let's let's actually talk about the program. We've been kind of talking all around it. What exactly is the program? So SHPEP is a free, you hear that free? <laughs> Cha-ching, I, I got that free. <laughs> I like to emphasize that program for freshmen and sophomore college students interested in one of eight health professions. So it's not only medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, public health, nursing, physical therapy, therapy optometry, and, and for physician assistants. Yes. And so it's a, a program that the student, the residentially based program in the summer, six weeks, you get to stay at a academic health center on their campus and you get to learn everything you need to know about that profession. So for example, I'll talk about medicine since that is the most longstanding component. The students will spend six weeks. They live on campus with other students like themselves. They're usually about, it's 80 students per site usually. And the student has an opportunity to participate in academic enrichment. So they really get into the basic sciences and math, study and learning skills. They get to shadow. Um, it sets up 5% of the program, but they get to see surgeries or they get to observe babies being born or, you know, work in the lab. And so it really gives them a, a really well-rounded view of what it would be like in the future, but also prepares them for what they need to do now as a student to prepare for that pathway. So, you know, understanding how to study, that's important. Understanding how to use money because financial liter- literacy is, is key because it, it is a significant investment of money in the future, but it's definitely doable. And so it really tries to capture the student's experience holistically to prepare them for that pathway. And just to piggyback off of that, I agree that the six weeks is really a lot about career enrichment. But something that I like to reiterate just to potential applicants is that it's also the time for them to get that shadowing experience and realize, is this the career for them? Mm -hmm. So a lot of students may leave the actual program afterwards and decide, I might need to transition or go into another career field or another health career track. And we understand that. And that's sort of why we also encourage, you know, freshmen and sophomore, it's easier for you to transition at that point in your time. So in your career. So I think it's important that the students know a lot of students may come into the program for six weeks and decide afterwards, I thought I wasn't interested in, in dentistry, but now that I took this program, I got that exposure. I realized maybe I'm interested in nursing or another aspect of the health profession. So and it's fun because it is fun. A lot of <laughs> students develop lifelong friendships as a result because they're all together for six weeks and going through this ex- unique experience together. And so they really get to be in students who are just like them from across the country. So that's also very exciting to have that experience that's very unique each year. And also for students who can't afford to travel to a site, because we have 12 sites across the U.S., we have a travel scholarship, and they also get a stipend. So it's really meant to provide a really a fully accessible program for students. Let's talk about the, the day-to-day. So it's six weeks, and I think you said 5% of it is, is shadowing. Is the majority of the time spent in a classroom setting, listening to, to lecturers talking about financial stuff and and more of the academic stuff, learning how to study, or are there other aspects of the program as well outside of the classroom? I think the, I would say probably the majority are inside the majority of the time is inside the classroom. There are like community based projects as well. There's some work in laboratories. Students get to participate in clinical simulations. So you do get out into the clinical environment, into the community. A lot of the programs focus on health and healthcare disparities. So everyone gets a really good experience. So it's not necessarily always the traditional sit in a lecture hall. There is a good part of that, but there are other ways of learning that are integrated. And then on the weekend, students do also get some field trips. So depending on what program site they are 
where they're located, they'll actually get to explore that state and within that particular city or around that campus. They'll have some field trips and just get to network with other healthcare professionals as well while they're there. So like Norma said, there really is that great aspect of fun that's available within the, you know, within the six week experience. Very cool. Yeah. And, and I want to uh, highlight, and, and you guys highlighted it as well, just getting together in a room of other pre-meds or pre-dent or pre-PA, whatever you guys are, obviously for this podcast, mostly pre-meds listening, but getting together in a room for that long with somebody who obviously has at least maybe some of the same struggles that you've been on, the, the connections there, the networking there is just so powerful. I know when when I travel and, and I go and speak at conferences, I get the opportunity to hold meetups and, and students come and we have dinner. And I do that just to get the students together because I know that the relationships that form just from having one dinner together can be powerful. So I can't imagine six weeks together is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we it's interesting because the experience is not only with your peers, but with others. You know, you really get a sense of what, what it's like to be in a medical dental school and a pharmacy school when you're in this program. And then you're surrounded by not only your peers, but individuals who are truly invested in seeing you grow and be successful. And I think that's what really makes a difference with SHPP. It's the environment and the culture that is embedded within the program experience that every institution there, you know, can say, oh, I know, you know, this dentist, or I know this physician, or I know this scientist who really believes in me because they were my faculty member at HPP and they could write me a letter. So that we always hear that from students that it makes a world of a difference in building their kind of social capital because sometimes mm -hmm. some students, depending on their experiences, never really has someone who they can call up and say, hey, can I come shadow? But they have this experience now where they could, you know, they know a physician who really is invested in their development. So and that yeah. makes a difference as well. Yeah. And then when they go back to wherever they're in school, maybe that physician that they've connected with will know somebody back in their hometown and, and can continue shadowing mm -hmm. based on that connection. Exactly. Very cool. So you mentioned that it's free. Now, as a college student, I hear free and, and sometimes that's exciting. Sometimes I think, what's the catch? So uh, <laughs> you, you mentioned that this is... This is a program funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so let's talk the application process. There's there's no application fee. There's there's no fees that you're you don't want any money from me. It's a question we get. I don't know, you know, it's a question we get often, but we really don't want any money. Now, at this point, I don't know, Norma, if you want to there is a travel scholarship. So some students may have to pay the travel in advance. But they will be reimbursed. Okay. So I'm not sure, Norma, how you want to term that or if you want to, how do we want to phrase that with the, you know, because it is free in that you'll get, you'll get a reimbursement. Yeah. However, and I is, think, is the, yeah. the travel scholarship, is that a guaranteed thing? If a student says, hey, like I put it on my credit card, I, I can't really afford this. What's the probability that somebody's going to get that scholarship? If the scholarship is, based on oftentimes student needs. So it might not be fully funded, but they will get some funding to attend the program site. Okay. To travel to. So, yeah. Okay. So there are now there's no cost to participate, but students may have to pay their travel up front mm -hmm. depending on how the site manages that process. But in terms of there's no application fee, there's no fee to participate, that's the only probably out of pocket cost that they'll have. And right. then, then they have a stipend, which, you know, hopefully will offset other costs. Like What's the meal, stipend right now? Almost, it is six hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah. It's six hundred dollars. So, consistent, yeah, throughout all the program sites. Okay. Regardless of location. Okay. Let's talk about the locations. You mentioned there are twelve locations that a student could possibly go to. Where Where are those locations currently? Oh, we're all across the country since it is a nationally recognized program. So I list the schools, uh, Columbia University, Howard University, Rutgers, University of Alabama, UCLA, University of Florida, Go the Gators. University of Iowa, 
in University of Louisville, University of Nebraska, the University of Texas, University of Washington, and last but not least, Western University, which is also in California. Okay. So they're all across the country. <laughs> okay. And are they located at the medical school or at the undergrad campus? What does that look like? They primarily are located on the, you know, some of them have undergraduate campuses, some of the schools don't. So they're always at, within the academic health centers. So sometimes some, some of the classes may be in the medical school, the nursing school, the pharmacy school. It just depends because each program offers different health professions. But they definitely will be in, in the same environment that medical dental school students or other health profession students are in. Uh, okay, so every site doesn't necessarily offer all of the different programs for the, the different tracks that students are on. Exactly. Okay. And that's where the student will have to visit the website, shpc.org. And there's a list in the application process where you can choose what career track you're interested in, and it'll show you the list of what program sites. Okay. actually take that, you know, that career track. But all of the program sites, all of the 12 program sites do have medicine and dentistry. Okay. They all have the medicine and dentistry track. Okay. Yeah. So for the purposes of, of our audience, every site is open. Yeah. Very cool. there okay. You go. All right. Perfect. Awesome. So let's talk about the locations themselves. When a student is applying, how much say do they have and where they get to go? Or is it just you guys pick where where students are placed. Well, and that's where I think it's really open, and that's where we want the students to take charge because they really have a big say where it comes to what program site they want to choose. Students actually get to choose up to three program sites across the country, and we really try to encourage students to get outside of their residency. So, for instance, if you are from the New York area, maybe pursue California, you know, UCLA or Western University. That's where we really do encourage them just to get out of their comfort zone and sort of take a leap to another program site that's out of your state. So students can choose up to three program sites, but where it might get tricky is depending on, we also encourage them to choose up to three health career tracks because we do encourage interprofessional education. Yeah. And so even though you might be a a medical pre-med student, you also, it's important that you know what a nurse does or what a pharmacist does. So they can choose up to three health career tracks outside of, you know, medicine or dentistry. And so it, up to those three, they can choose up to those three program sites and dependent on what program site they get selected. Sometimes students get selected uh, with all three and then they'll have to make a decision on what program site they like to choose from those three that selected them. Okay. So let's let's finish off the application process before we move on to to some other stuff I want to talk about. The application deadline as we are recording this and as this goes out it's right around the corner so the application deadline for 2019 is february 15th so a week after this comes out how troublesome is that for somebody who's just learning about this program right now for them to go to shpep.org and start an application how long does that application process typically take Well, I would say that the first thing they should do is get their transcript sent in because that takes some time. Go to their registrar, get their transcript sent to the program. So to download the document for that, if they can identify someone who's written a letter for them in terms of recommendation, there's one recommendation that's required. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the program, the application for the program is very similar to maybe like a college application where you're just filling out kind of basic demographic information. You have this one essay to be done and then getting those documents is important because they have to be postmarked by February 15th. Okay. And I'm looking at the the requirements here. You do have a minimum GPA requirement of 2.5 overall. And just to ask one clarification here, it says must be a high school graduate. Does GED count for that or no? Yes. It does. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. So, so if you're listening to this right now and you want to apply, again, shpep.org, and there's a, a nice little button there that says how to apply. You click on that and all the information is there. One of the biggest things that a student listening to this is going to ask is, is this worth my time? AKA, how is this going to help me with my application? What do you tell students with who, who are asking about 
how this reflects on their medical school application or what you teach students there about the medical school application process to help them in the future? Well, I think, first of all, it is very well worth their time. You know, this program is grounded in many years of experience about what works. And so they're going to get a really good inside view of what they need to do to be successful along the pathway to whatever health profession they're interested in. And so the six weeks, I know sometimes students are trying to weigh what, well, should I work or should I do something else, another class or maybe, you know, go abroad. As a freshman and sophomore college student, you know, this is a prime time, as Chant has mentioned earlier, to really understand if this is a pathway for you. And so it really is a good investment because you're investing in yourself and your own knowledge and opportunity. And so, and our data shows that individuals are more likely to get accepted to medical school and dental school as a result of participating in this program. Very cool. So that's, that should be an easy sell, right? You're more likely to get accepted. Okay, sold, done. And it's free, right? Did we mention it's Nothing free? Nothing left to say. <laughs> the, the other thing that students really love are free t-shirts. Do you guys give t-shirts? <laughs> Actually, you know, what's funny, funny, funny is that the students design their own, oftentimes yeah. they design their own t-shirts as part of the program. So we think that's really cool. Yeah. So, you know. That's just a way for them to demonstrate their creativity and really take ownership of the program. So every summer, we we always get jealous because we have to do site visits. And we're like, we want the T-shirt. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So they, they take ownership and they, they can create it. I did ask students that I told them that I was going to be doing an interview with the SHPEP and what questions did they have? And I think we've covered most of them. One good question came in from an alumni of the program and they asked, what are the options or availabilities for an alumnus to stay involved in the program? Oh, that's a great question, Ryan. And, I, and it's a perfect timing. Like you, know, you noted earlier, this is our 30th anniversary, 2019. So we have really been working hard to reconnect with our alumni. We're going to have a lot of alumni-based events just to celebrate the 30th anniversary throughout this year. And so we'll have some speed networking opportunities, some professional development sessions available, particularly during the late summer here in Washington, D.C. So we encourage all of our alumni, whether you were part of the MMEP, SMEP, SMDEP, <laughs> and now SEPEP, that's a lot of acronyms there, but we, we encourage all of, our, of those alumni. Right now we have an estimated over 27,000. Wow. alumni that have participated in the program. And so definitely touch base with us via email, shpep underscore alumni at aamc.org and send us your contact information and we will definitely connect with you and keep you informed of all of the great alumni-based resources we have available for our alumni. The tagline we like to use when it comes to our alumni, it's a summer opportunity that lasts a lifetime. Like we are going to be your connection and your support throughout your whole entire career pathway from beginning to end. But sometimes we lose those folks just because the program has been around for so long. Mm. Their contact information might have changed when they attended the program. So that's why, again, we just want you all to reach out to us. The alumni email, shpp underscore alumni at aamc.org, and we will definitely connect with you. Let's talk real quick about how somebody is actually selected to attend. So a student is able to fill out their application, get it in before the deadline. How are you actually making the decision as to, to who gets in and, and who doesn't? And how, how many applicants do you get for the spots that you have? So I can start. We have a little over 1,000 slots or spaces across the, you know, across the U.S. And this actually the program sites make the, the admissions decisions. So we have national program office. We just help facilitate the process. And so what, what the program sites are looking for is fit. So, you know, does this student in their essay speak to why this program will be helpful to them, for example? 
you know, what is it about their experiences tell us that they need this program? And so that really what is it, it's about. I mean, you mentioned earlier the GPA, you know, it's 2.5 because we recognize that students sometimes need support and that the GPA doesn't always reflect their talents or their skills. And so it really is about the holistic view of the student and how that fits with the program's objectives. Okay. So about a thousand spots and how many applicants do you get for those spots? Usually we get in terms of completed applications, which means that they've submitted everything. Um, we get about 35 to 3,700 on average. Okay. So about a, a 30 ish percent chance, 33% chance of getting accepted. So that's good. Yeah. And we like to encourage students that, you know, freshman students just to add, if you do apply as a freshman and, and unfortunately you don't get in your freshman year, you can have absolutely reapply again as a sophomore. Okay. So Very that's cool. good to know. Is there anything else that we haven't covered here that you think a, a pre-med student specifically should know about SHPEP? Well, I think in general, not just SHPP, but there's so many programs out there that support students. And I think part of it is knowing about them is the first step. And yep. sometimes we find students don't have access to the information. So this is great that we're talking with you about SHPEP. But that if they don't get into SHPP or they find that maybe they're like, oh, well, it's not relevant because I'm already a junior or senior, that many of our medical schools have very similar programs. And so we'd encourage them if they have medical school in their state or region, in their local community, to reach out to those institutions to find out what programs are available. And AMC has a great um, list of programs and resources as well on their website for students. And so I think, you know, for those students who say, well, this is not for me again because I'm past that stage, we ask you to be an ambassador for us and share this information with other students, maybe at your college or university, maybe it's in your community, maybe even you have family members. And so, we, you know, we, we find that it's very important. It's our constant mission to make sure that we make this program accessible. And so this opportunity to talk to everybody is exciting. So we hope that, you know, individuals, if they don't apply because they're beyond the point that they at least share it with others. Just to add, I would say that some of the, when I'm going out to the recruitment events, a lot of the students may worry actually about the date of the program because six weeks for the summer, as Norma mentioned earlier, it, it might be trivial if they're deciding that they want to take another summer class or they want to go on vacation. So I like to say most of our program sites, the date for the programs, they usually range between late May as the earliest start date, but everybody should be done by early July. So it definitely leaves some room for you to enjoy the, the latter part of your summer. There's something else to consider. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Again, that was Shantez and Norma, both from the SHPEP program, which you can find at SHPEP. Again, if you're listening to this in early 2019, as this podcast comes out, if you're listening to this before February 15th, go apply shpep.org. Click on the how to apply button and figure out everything that you need to do to get your application in on time to have an amazing summer learning all about the health profession that you are interested in for free. It's free. Did we mention it's free? And, and apparently you get a t-shirt too that you get to make, which is awesome. I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any suggestions for programs or any sort of organizations out there that may be doing amazing things for pre-med students, shoot me an email, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net, and I'll see if I can have them on to have a conversation in the future. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on The Pre-Med Years. 